can be here, but it is also a call for papers because as we've tried to keep the, the size um, somewhat small uh, so that we can get input from everyone, you'll see that uh, it's going to be challenging for this many people to be heard in a meaningful way. And you may find, you will likely find, that you would like to add to your thoughts um, after this event. And so it's really a call for papers uh, for input as to what should this uh, market look like in the United States. Uh, the, the potential for initial coin offerings is tremendous. Uh, it certainly far exceeds uh, the tech sector or the financial sector. I've talked with CEOs of very substantial entities uh, that see the benefit of having something that isn't uh, common stock or, or even traditional shares that, that approximates the tokens that are out there today and could be used with a wide range of application. It has the potential to transform the way companies of all sizes raise capital, uh, but it has an opportunity to deal with things in a way that protect privacy, that um, provide security, and uh, if we get it right, may actually increase transparency. Right now, it is a little bit like the Wild West. You can see the call in the recent weeks in the UK uh, to kind of put it into the Wild West. And it's interesting to see the UK talk about the Wild West. Uh, I'm not sure what it means there. But, uh, but uh, th there's uh, this, this opportunity right now where, unfortunately, some folks have crept in and used uh, the regulatory arbitrage in a bad way, uh, there's some fraud in the industry, and I think the legitimate players in the industry uh, have a desire for some sort of regulatory certainty, so that we can make it sure that make it easier to detect, um, prevent, and prosecute fraud. So uh, I think we all have a common interest in that. But I really look forward to your ideas. So I don't want to talk too much longer. I want to give uh, my colleague Ted Budd a chance to to speak. But uh, I want to highlight a little bit about the format, so as Jerry's going through this, you'll understand. We have three sections, so if you look on your table, you have an agenda uh, where you've got uh, token taxonomy. I believe the folks that this is most relevant to, it's relevant to everyone in the room and many people who couldn't be here um, are, are generally seated on this end of the room. Uh, and we'll direct most of the comments towards that section. So. People will have two minutes. Uh, we'll have people with mobile microphones who will come to you. So you'll raise your hand, seek to be recognized, and uh, Jerry will moderate those comments. However, everyone in the room is able to participate on any given topic, um, and, uh, and, and we'll see how the dialogue goes. Uh, from time to time, we'll interject the follow-up questions I, I anticipate. And then as we go down to the next discussion topic, that's towards the center of the room. It didn't quite get laid out the way we wanted. I don't think we need this much of a platform for our space. Uh, but uh, so apologies, it's not quite laid out the way the uh, diagram in your handouts shows. Uh, but there's folks in the center uh, where uh, compliance uh, and consumer protection might be the most relevant topic. Uh, but everyone's welcome to comment. And then, you know, finally, uh, as we look at the rest, you're generally in the back over there. So. Uh, the neat thing about this room, the, in my opinion, the Library of Congress is one of the most beautiful buildings the United States government owns. Uh, this room is the members, uh, members' room. It's obviously a bit older, and so the lighting isn't the, the most beautiful uh, in that sense, but the room itself is. So hopefully you find it a neat space, and uh, most of all, that you'll find it a productive meeting. So thanks so much, and I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Ted Budd. Thank you, Warren. Really appreciate your, and uh, again, I think we're going to have Congressman Emmer join us here in a little bit, but uh, Warren, really appreciate your friendship and your leadership on this, and also to uh, Ron from your staff, and uh, Jerry for moderating today. Uh, really appreciate you and your leadership in this whole industry, uh, what we call the Wild West, and maybe we're the Wild West as far as uh, being from the West here. Um, you know, um, I'm just glad to know that you, and that you clarified, Warren, how people were arranged in this room, and then it's not by party. I was thinking this was unaffiliated here in the middle. I didn't know. But anyway, glad you all are here. Um, I want to just mention a couple of things that we have uh, a letter going out this week to the SEC on token clarity. In that letter, uh, we're asking, um, that's Warren Davidson, Tom Emmer, and myself, uh, we're asking for guidelines on what makes a security a token or not, or what makes a security a token or not. We ask for better articulation of SEC policy 
and ultimately we're asking for formal guidance uh, in that letter. Um, I've also got H.R. 5036, the Financial Technology Protection Act. It's on the suspension calendar uh, for coming up this Wednesday. This is a non-regulatory bill that gives the private sector additional tools and resources to deal with the illicit use of digital currency. Uh, so this is a timely event for each and every one of us here, so I'm grateful for each of you for joining us, and I know this is going to be a great discussion, so thank you so much. On. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jerry Brito, and I'm the executive director of Coin Center. Uh, Coin Center is an independent nonprofit uh, based here in D.C., and we're focused on the public policy issues that affect cryptocurrencies and open blockchain networks. Um, so I'm very honored uh, to be moderating uh, this discussion um, until uh, a day or two ago. I was slated to be a panelist, um, and Mr. Davidson and his staff very graciously asked if I might step in um, uh, sort of as an independent expert to call on folks um, uh, and uh, sort of try to lead the discussion. Um, I want to, you know, first of all, thank uh, Mr. Davidson for his leadership and putting this together and bringing together this amazing uh, group of folks uh, for what is a much needed discussion, um, as well as uh, Mr. Budd uh, for uh, coming and his leadership actually in, in a lot of the uh, um, uh, policy issues around this, this topic. Um, and I also want to especially thank all of you for coming all the way out here. I know many of you have traveled from around the country um, to be here today, and it shows how important um, all of you, how seriously all of you take um, coming to D.C. and engaging in a constructive and productive dialogue uh, with folks here who want to um, get the rules right so that we can have uh, an innovative and productive industry. Um, as this is the last uh, legislative uh, session week before elections, um, and it's also considered a fly-in day, um, as we say here. Um, members, uh, like Mr. Soto, Mr. Emmer, um, uh, will be coming in and out. Um, so uh, if a member comes in, we'll stop the uh, proceedings to uh, let them introduce themselves and, and get them up to speed. Um, uh, for the attendees uh, today, you know, today's round roundtable, just so you understand, is uh, considered a very informal workshop. Um, and it's a listening session uh, for the members uh, to determine what elements are necessary to bring forth in legislation. So what you say here today, um, the members and their staff will be taking notes uh, to consider about what might be necessary to, to include in legislation. So please understand that. Um, so that we can accommodate all of you, there's, I think, uh, over 45 participants. Um, we're going to ask you to keep your remarks short, uh, maybe to two minutes. And um, please forgive me, but I'll be trying to, to enforce that uh, as uh, um, uh, 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 stringently as I can. Um, as Mr. Davidson said, we're, we're going to have three panels. Um, it's because we don't exactly have three tables. It's going to be kind of difficult to limit the discussion to any particular table. Um, so I think folks should be uh, uh, sort of free to raise their hands if they have a contribution for that. But please, if you if you know you're not on one of the session one of the sections that is uh, um, called up for the moment. Um, maybe allow those folks who are to, to speak first. Um, so without delay, why don't we uh, get started? So the first uh, session uh, is on token taxonomy, which um, I'm going to stand so you all can see me. Um, I can see all of you. Uh, it's about classification. It's about what are um, these tokens? What are these currencies? Are they securities, commodities? Uh, are they currencies? Um, how do we make those determinations? And so the way I thought I'd approach each of these um, sessions is to maybe um, ask uh, a sort of opening question uh, that's broad um, to get some reaction from folks. And I think the, the taxonomy folks are more on this side. So I'll ask a question um, to maybe kick it off, and then we, maybe folks can react to, to that answer. And of course, members, please. Um, uh, uh, let us know what questions you may have. So the first question I have is, given um, that over the past several months, the SEC has given us um, uh, a lot of good clarity about um, tokens um, and about uh, how they view their classification. So for example, um, they've made it pretty clear, um, at least in the staff's view, that tokens like Bitcoin and Ethereum and things like them are not securities. And they've also made it pretty clear that um, tokens that have been offered um, uh, in pre-sales as securities are clearly securities. 
So given that we have that um, clarity now, what's left, right? What's left in the middle? What's unclear that you would like to see um, uh, answered? And to, to address that, I would ask maybe if there's somebody from industry who's uh, maybe engaged in an ICO, offered an ICO, and now you have a lack of clarity, we'll, we'll come to you. So I see Marvin and I see Ryan. Anybody else? So we'll start with Marvin. Let's go to Ryan. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'd like to echo Jerry's thanks on behalf of you know our 100 employees and over a thousand accredited investors in our in our token. Uh, maybe oh, you can I just say, please introduce yourself and who you are, what company sure. you're with. Sure. Uh, I'm Marvin Amori. I'm the general counsel of Protocol Labs, uh, and in many ways we're, we're a pretty traditional Silicon Valley story. Our founder studied distributed computing at Stanford. He went through Y Combinator the same accelerator that Dropbox and Airbnb and Reddit went through. Uh, and we, in other ways, we're different. We invented a low-level open source protocol that's uh, a competitor with HTTP to try to change the way the internet works in terms of storing and sharing data so that you could more easily uh, share data in a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized way where data can be stored and shared uh, not just in big data centers. Uh, a year ago, we did our token sale. It's called Filecoin. Uh, at the time, it was the biggest uh, token sale uh, that had happened. It was over 200 million. And the, uh, the technology will permit people to essentially rent their hard drive space to people who need storage space. So that rather than, you know, if you have an application and you want a decentralized application, you could store the files, the images, the videos in a decentralized and distributed way. Uh, it's a very ambitious project, and a lot of people uh, were willing to invest in it, in, in the tokens, including investors like Sequoia, Andreessen Horowitz in the room, Union Square Ventures in the room, and the Digital Currency Group in the room is also an investor. Uh, the three people who invented it, you know, one of them went to MIT as a grad student at the age of 14, the youngest uh, grad student ever accepted at MIT. A whole bunch of really smart people that I work for trying to do something uh, really innovative and very challenging. When we uh, did our token sale, there was not that much certainty, but we were able to work with uh, some really great lawyers uh, to come up with uh, a framework that we thought worked, the SAFT framework, one sitting right next to me, uh, named Marco Santori. And the framework we, we put out was, hey, we believed that because we were pre-selling a token, that it likely would be treated as a security by the SEC. There, there are strengths and weaknesses to that from a policy perspective, but we believe we have to do that to comply. Uh, we are going to deliver our Filecoin token network. Hopefully, you know, we're building it now, hopefully within the next two years. Uh, and we are not sure at what point it will be considered a security or not a security. The, the guidance from the SEC, which is very welcome, uh, essentially says, uh, you know, if you're decentralized enough, then you're not a security. We're not sure what that, what that line is. We're not sure when we've crossed it. Uh, as a general counsel, I talk to lots of outside lawyers, and I feel like there's a cascade of uncertainty. When the SEC is a little uncertain, every law firm has their own special interpretation that you can pay them to give you, and they all try to distinguish themselves from each other, so it's like a prism from violet to, to red of different legal advice. Uh, so that's, that's one big area of uncertainty. Uh, and uh, the, I'll just tell you the most depressing moment I've had, Jerry, if I can, as general counsel, which is talking to different law firms about, um, as a sort of contingency, about reincorporating abroad if we have to. Uh, as an American company with American leadership, uh, you know, we definitely want to build our company here, build our tech here, uh, but our investors have told us, you know, you need a backup plan, and I know in increasingly Companies that do launch token sales now tend to exclude the US. So I just want to give you those two vignettes of, of a day in my life. Hi, I'm Ryan Singer. I'm the CEO of Chia Network. Uh, I co-founded it last year with Bram Cohen, the guy who invented BitTorrent. And uh, the goal is really just to build a more sustainable, more useful, and more professional digital money for the globe. And it's been really interesting just kind of navigating what that means in 2017 and 2018. Um, 
So um, I've talked about this on stage a little bit. We're going to be taking the company public before we launch the network. This is our way of coping with regulatory uncertainty is to basically partner with the SEC and give them a thing they know how to regulate, uh, which has been expensive and difficult, but it's fine. They've been very approachable, actually. It's just the lawyers that are expensive and difficult. Um, but uh, we have kind of the same basic issue that Filecoin does. We call it the Ethereum question. So uh, Ethereum, as I think everybody knows, did this pre-sale back in the day before anyone knew what was going on. And then the SEC said recently that the way that the uh, network functions now, it's definitely more of a commodity than a security in terms of how the exchange ecosystem looks and how people use the token and kind of all of that stuff. And uh, it's our plan to only sell equity until after our Ethereum moment. And then after that, once the network's sufficiently functional and decentralized and everyone's happy, then we're willing to participate in the token economy too. Uh, the problem is right now is we have no clarity to give uh, ourselves or even our investors or the SEC about when that moment's gonna be. We just know for a fact that it's not gonna be the day after network launch. <laughs> it's at least gonna be a little bit farther than that. And so when we're talking in DC and when we're uh, playing this game that you play here, that's really what we're looking for is we're trying to understand, um, can we have a basic definition of what's decentralized enough, what's functional enough, uh, what's the point where we can be another player in the ecosystem and not necessarily an issuer of an investment opportunity. Thank you. I, I would just interject here because we've had a couple things on file, and and one that uh, to, to try to shape if you've got input, because a lot of the companies in this dilemma, we'll call it the file coin dilemma, um, are early stage companies. And let's just say that if Apple, who we can all I think agree is sitting on a fair bit of cash, when they decided to launch iCloud, if they just said, you know, we're just going to sell tokens for a terabyte of data on iCloud. Most people believed Apple had the technical expertise and the capital to create iCloud. Uh, they probably had it working quite well before they even told anyone it existed. But if they had chosen to do it with a token to raise the capital, put I, iCloud out there, and they said, you know, if for some reason this thing gets glitchy and it doesn't quite work right, uh, we're not going to reimburse you for the token. I mean, the tokens get some risk that the product doesn't actually work. Does it look different? Um, are you really buying shares of Apple? Are you buying, it's not clearly not common stock. Um, and so I think that's a, you know, it hopefully touches on at least where my current understanding is, is is there really such a thing as this token that has, whether you call it a utility token or or some some means of exchange that is not quite uh, what we, what the current securities market defines. And does that inherently look different just because of the amount of capital on the balance sheet of the entity offering the token? My name is Marco Santori. Uh, I am the president and chief legal officer of a company called Blockchain, uh, which is easy to remember. Uh, <laughs> not only because of the name, but we're also the largest uh, wallet in the space, which is to say people come to blockchain not to uh, speculate on the price of cryptocurrencies, but to actually uh, use them. Uh, and soon we'll be supporting a number of other cryptocurrencies, but beyond uh, just the three that, um, a number of the tokens, I should say, beyond just the three that we support today. Um, so blockchain is focused on functionality. We are focused on people actually using these things as goods in commerce, as commercial consumer functional goods, um, which was actually a, a nice dovetail from my last job, where I was a partner at Cooley, which is an international law firm. And I, uh, in my capacity as a partner at Cooley, I co-authored, uh, along with Protocol Labs, a paper called the SAFT Project White Paper. Uh, the SAFT that stands for Simple Agreement for Future Tokens. Um, it was a self-regulatory effort, uh, a response to the rash of ICOs, which we defined as pre-functional token sales, um, happening both in the U.S. and abroad. And what we identified in those sales were particular risks. We identified 
risks that were usually attendant to investors and not consumers. And the reason for those risks that we at least articulated in the white paper uh, was that the people who purchase these things prior to functionality are by and large reliant on the, on the technical and managerial expertise of the issuer to actually do the things, to actually create functionality in these tokens so that the tokens can do the things that the issuers promised that they would do, whether in their white paper or elsewhere. And so the, 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 the SAF project uh, was launched in, um, uh, around this time last year, and we did not invent the SAF by, by any stretch. Uh, we, we took a look at it, we tried to systematize it, we tried to make it rigorous. Um, and, uh, but it's become an industry standard. The overwhelming majority of token sales that occur in the United States, at least, are, uh, are SAFTs. For those of us that were involved in the early project, I, I think we all recognize that is not an ideal situation. As Coin Center, uh, as Coin Center put it, um, the SAFT was a, is a symptom of regulatory uncertainty. It is not the best we can do. It is the best we could do under current law. Um, so the answer in the SAF framework uh, of when a token becomes uh, transitions from what would be a security to an actual functional token is when the uh, recipients of that token, when the, when the purchasers in that original sale uh, are no longer so reliant on the efforts of the issuer to uh, produce actual functionality in that token that uh, something else is affecting the price of that token. And so the risk of loss to the, to the purchaser is more of a consumer risk, that the thing can't be used as well or something to that effect. Um, and it's no longer the risk that the issuer uh, will just walk away from the project. Or as you put it, uh, Congressman, that, the, um, that iCloud would just never get launched. We don't think that's ideal. We think that's a symptom of current law. Um, and one of the ways that um, Congress could, could work to, to change that is to provide some certainty. Thank you, Congressman Davidson, for the opportunity to pull this together today. My name is Michael Hiles. I am the CEO of a company based in Cincinnati, Ohio, called 10XTS. And we are building an ecosystem and a consortium for early stage capital funding uh, that involves traditional VC, angel, uh, angel networks. And uh, one of the things that we've recognized um, next year, I will personally have been coding for 40 years. And um, so I'm tech and business. And in the early days of computing, we had these things called computing service centers where we went in and we rented processor time and ran our programs and got green bar reports. And when you look at the uh, analogy of blockchain today, we're paying people for computing services on an incremental basis to support a data utility. And that means that the token type for things like gas, paying for these transaction, is distinctly different than the token type for, say, tokenization of a security. So we focus less on the token itself and really try to place the focus back onto the nature of the transaction itself. The token is simply a byproduct of the transaction, but we still need a definition of those types of things around uh, application utilities that unlock features in an application. If I'm paying for computing services to support uh, a data utility, and we get into things like unincorporated associations. What are the risks associated with people who are running nodes that are supporting a data utility on a disconnected basis. Uh, but it's really a function of securities tokens being really a security, but then what's the status of this utility piece where we're paying for computing from a transactional standpoint? And, and in our system, we're contemplating the usage of both. So it's a very interesting uh, conundrum that we have. And so really the understanding of the clarity around payment for computing services on a free market floating basis that's tradable after the fact. We have a open market for trading these tokens that can fluctuate in pricing on a speculative basis, but it doesn't change the fact that we're still paying for computing services on a service bureau basis. So I would encourage uh, legislative effort and clarification from the regulatory bodies to identify 
and understand the distinction between those types of contexts of different types of tokens and how they work within different, different functions of computing. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Davidson, for uh, holding the session today. I'm David Taub, a partner in the law firm of McDermott, Will and & Emery, and that fact notwithstanding, I will keep my comments to well under two minutes. Um, I had our firm's financial institutions group and have practiced in around the financial products markets for over 30 years in derivatives and structured products. There are several issues that um, and ambiguities in the law that, uh, that uh, plague the market uh, for cryptocurrency uh, today. But I see the key one as being uh, the definitions around full functionality as opposed to decentralization. Um, in our experience with clients that we've worked with in this space, um, none expect on the day they launch to be decentralized. Perhaps some can argue that they will, but most can't. And um, what they will be, however, is functional. And for their platforms to be useful, the tokens on their platforms need to be freely transferable. And for them to be freely transferable, they need not to be securities. And so fundamentally, I think we would benefit from a clear definition of functionality, and that that definition triggers the ability for tokens to be not securities and be freely transferable. Hello, I'm Ryan Zagon from Ripple. We're a company using blockchain and crypto assets to improve cross-border payments, uh, taking payments from, say, two to four days down to a few seconds at a much lower cost. Looking at the token taxonomy topic, I want to expand the lens out some from ICOs to broader crypto. It's a, it's a, it's a broader world than just ICOs and the importance of looking at uh, this entire sector. So we see recognition globally that blockchain and crypto assets will play a pivotal role in the next generation of finance and our national economies. And there are countries racing to provide regulatory certainty so they can be the winner in this race. They can essentially take a stake as the, the global capital of finance, which is now in the U.S. moving elsewhere. We're seeing national holistic frameworks in other countries designed to drive the adoption of this tech. You can look at U.K., Singapore, Japan, in the UK, there's now more people working in fintech than New York. Also, Japan, Singapore, and Australia combined. So the race is real. We're, they're winning because they have one framework that covers this entire technology. It gives certainty to the market across a variety of these technologies. Certainty is that prerequisite for adoption, and it's enabling much faster growth. Well, we, from the US's perspective, that's a, that's a strategy we invented in the early 90s with the, with the advent of the Internet. The White House came forth with one framework for electronic commerce that gave certainty to the market for Internet development, and that spurred the U.S. to be a leader in Internet technology. We see opportunity to take the same opportunity or uh, the same um, uh, a move today, one framework for this entire technology. From a legislative perspective, I think the one – a low-hanging fruit we can, we can pull on is driving more coordination amongst regulators, uh, particularly on uh, token taxonomy um, and discussions of how risk uh, should be addressed uh, at company levels, what kind of mitigants, what type of uh, uh, best practices, and what type of licensing and registration. Uh, thank you for your time today, and we appreciate the leadership both of you have had. Hi, my name is uh, Joyce Lai. I'm from Consensus. Um, we are a venture production studio um, focusing on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, we had our first office in New York, but are now um, at over 1,100 people globally. Um, so. One perspective that I – well, the first one I wanted to make was to echo the previous panelist's point, which is that the competition around the world is real, but I think that there is still definitely time and opportunity for the U.S. to be a real leader here. Um, the, the, the perspective that we have here at Consensus is that 
we are a technology focused company. So naturally, when we think of these types of problems, we ask ourselves, is there ways to use the technology itself to build these types of solutions directly into perhaps the token itself? Um, so in the context of taxonomy, um, some of the ways that we can think about this problem is actually, you know, how is the token actually built and what are the, the rights or um, you know, conditions and obligations that are built into the token itself. So for example, um, you know, we can look into things like a requirement for a particular purchaser of the token to actually use the token on the network before they can do something else with it, maybe transfer, right? So these are some of the more creative things that technologists here at Consensus are thinking about to try to provide more clarity um, on this kind of hairy topic um, in a way that's, you know, easy and clear. Um, and also kind of back to your earlier question, uh, earlier point about, you know, Director Hinman's speech. Um, as a lawyer at Consensus, it is difficult because those speeches isn't necessarily the law. And so it, we definitely could appreciate and use a lot more uh, certainty on the legislative level just to help lawyers, you know, do their job and to be able to provide our clients advice that they really do need. Um, if we have a lot more clarity in that sense, I think we'll see a lot more projects um, who will be able to make that leap and be able to commit the, the type of time and energy that they need to have their projects here in the U.S. Yeah, thank you. And definitely, uh, I think everyone gets uh, how, how competitive globally. And a lot of anecdotes I could share with you from people talking about uh, their options around the world. And because it is digital, uh, it, it's pretty pretty agile in terms of where the investment goes. But uh, I think you touched on one other thing um, that I want to make sure that everyone thinks a little bit about is uh, what do you capture with the token? Because it's blockchain and because it's able to be layered, um, kind of inherent with the initial coin offering, um, you, you could have uh, what you need to know up front can be embedded into the actual token. And then the layers of privacy give it so that you know, only these people have access to this or only in these conditions is this layer revealed. And uh, I think it makes it an incredibly robust piece. That's kind of where I get at with uh, the transparency and security piece of it. Um, but this is exactly what we have to define here is what is this that we need to know? You get into know your customer provisions that we'll talk about later, um, custody, uh, all these things will be be sensitive, but it, it, it at least technologically can be embedded in the token itself uh, as long as it's on blockchain. Hi, uh, my name is Aaron Wright. I'm um, a professor at Cardozo Law School. I'm also uh, the director of Cardozo's blockchain project. Uh, I've, I've done quite a bit of work in this space, including uh, publishing a book with a co-author called Blockchain in the Law, The Rule of Code, which Harvard University Press just published. Uh, thank you very much, um, Rep uh, Representative Davison and Bud, for convening this. I think this is critically important. Uh, just to kind of take it up uh, a step, I think what's critically important on taxonomy issues is how much is at stake at, at getting this right. It clarifies from the U.S. perspective questions related to taxation. It, um, it clarifies issues related to uh, authority of various different agencies. So what authority does the SEC have over certain tokens? What authority does the uh, CFTC, the FTC, uh, and other regulators? Um, I think that's, uh, that's why this question of taxonomy becomes critically important. I think what's also important here is to recognize that not uh, that the, what can qualify as a token is exceptionally broad. Uh, and what we're seeing today is really just the first glimmer of what many entrepreneurs are dreaming about for the future. And what they're dreaming about is a world where more and more assets are uh, represented as tokens. So if we're going to act, we need to make sure that uh, we do so in a way that accommodates not just today's technology, but technology that comes forward in the future. Uh, what we've seen today, uh, particularly in the early wave of token sales, um, is an, an effort uh, in order to treat uh, many tokens as securities. If we do that, and if the classification of tokens are deemed to be securities across the board, it's going to be a massive expansion of power by the financial services industry. Uh, more and more assets that could be deemed as consumer goods will be purchased and will be required to be purchased through financial services companies, 
and other regulated entities. That is something that should be deeply concerning. At the same time, limiting the sale of tokens that are inherently consumer in nature or digital goods, uh, assets that are going to be used to access online services to accredited investors gives us accredited investors and other venture capitalists an incredible amount of power to manipulate the price of these assets to increase how much they cost, and that will lead to a, a potentially uh, disastrous result for everyday consumers. And I think we need to be very mindful of that going forward. With all that being said, I think that there is uh, there's a lot of uh, existing law that can be codified here in the common law that is focused in on use, not functionality, but on the use of these tokens. If consumers are using them, uh, then we know uh, that uh, it's likely that they're being used as a consumer good, and therefore it's likely that uh, they are not going to be deemed securities. I think we can also be creative here and think about other, um, other ways to address market manipulation, including technical screens or technical accreditation. I think we can also look at um, other areas uh, such as safe harbors, uh, along with uh, the ability to potentially place the onus on folks that want to sell these for a profit, so reseller rules or restrictions. So place the onus not on entrepreneurs, but on the investors that, that really bear the risk of market manipulation, speculation, and, and the ability to hurt consumers. Hi, I'm Hillary Kivitz. Um, I'm general counsel of Andreessen Horwitz's crypto fund. I'm standing just because the lectern's here. Hi. Um, so uh, we, we launched a crypto fund um, earlier this year because I think from our perspective, tokens are one of the most exciting technological um, you know, innovations right now. And um, the way we see tokens that I think differentiates them from, from corporate securities, let's say, is that tokens are an asset that facilitate a shared incentive network that should align the interests of all of the participants that use that technology, that build it, and then invest in it. And that concept, I think, for us is, is really a, a keystone around which we could try to begin to build some criteria um, around functionality um, to distinguish tokens from securities because I think we definitely agree that there's a phase um, in the early stages of when you're seeding a network, when you need to build it and you don't have a token ready to launch, that rightly should be governed by securities regulations. Um, that is a fundraising phase. But then where, you know, to, to capture the full power of the token and, and to unleash the technological innovation that, that really is there, these these networks shouldn't be governed by securities regulations because it really, um, you know, in, in a corporate securities context, what you'll find is um, securities are meant to maximize the value for the stakeholders, for the shareholders. That is their, um, you know, that is their goal. Whereas tokens, the value, the more people join the network, the more that participate, the more that build it, the greater the value of the tokens, and that accrues value for every participant in the network. So I think that paradigm shift is what we see as, as most exciting um, for, for um, a token framework. And, um, you know, to that end, we would su suggest building function, you know, functionality cr criteria around that. Jerry, oh, hang on. Hey, Hillary, before the microphone leaves, would you, you had a great definition earlier, or one that's quite fascinating. Would you be willing to repeat that early definition of how you see tokens? Sure. I think we see tokens as an asset that facilitates a shared incentive network where every participant derives value from the, the growth of the network. And I can give an example. So in, in the corporate context, um, because, the, because the goals of the corporation are to maximize value for its shareholders, there is a time at which, for a tech company in particular, the interests of the users of the technology might be at odds with the interests of the shareholders. So, and I think that's what you start to see when people complain that, you know, people of small businesses have launched on Amazon Web Services and their payments are getting slowed down. Or people are complaining that, you know, their search results are being deprioritized compared to Google's own, um, you know, businesses. That's an example of where, um, you know, the, in, the interest of maximizing the value for the shareholders of the company might be at odds with the value of the technology to the users. 
And I think that what the token accomplishes is that it should really align everybody's incentives. So it should not only the developers who are developing it or the, or the investors who are investing in the, in the token, but also the users, because at the end of the day, they're going to hold this token, and the more valuable the network is, the more valuable is the token in their hands. Good. Thank you, Hillary. Mr. Davidson and Mr. Butt, thank you for convening this. My name is Jonathan Johnson. I'm the president of Medici Ventures. We're a venture capital firm and incubator that invests in companies advancing blockchain technology. To most of us in this room, I think a discussion about regulation and certainly overregulation is anathema. However, uh, for many of us that are investing in companies or are part of companies that are trying to raise capital, certainty is important. Uh, we own a wallet company that uh, has an exchange for cryptocurrency and what I would call non-currency or non-security non uh, tokens. We also own a company that has an alternative trading system that is sanctioned by the SEC that trades about 2 or 3% of all the securities in the U.S. today that is creating a security token exchange. I think what is confusing the people that are issuing and investing in tokens is where should they trade? Will they be registered securities that must trade on a registered exchange, or are they unregistered securities that can trade on a wallet or non-security exchange? Bringing certainty to that question will be much appreciated by all of us. Hi. Um, thank you again, Congressman. Um, just want to reiterate the gratitude from this industry and how important this day is. Um, I want to uh, touch on a couple points. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Georgia Quinn, I'm the general counsel of CoinList. We're a platform to help issuers launch uh, compliant token offerings. Um, we offer a, a bevy of technology services from AML KYC, which I know we'll get into later, investor accreditation, verification, document automation, escrow automation, just to really create an end-to-end -end solution for these issuers that want to do it the right way. So a couple of points that I'd like to touch on. Um, first off, um, this alternative jurisdiction and kind of um, race uh, throughout the world to create a place where, you know, we have either some sort of set of regulations or, frankly, no regulations, to me, it creates potentially two problems. One, which we've addressed, um, you know, the flight of um, really talented people and entrepreneurship and great, you know, industry to other jurisdictions, but also, um, and probably more frighteningly, it creates um, a potential for real investor and consumer fraud and abuse. And so if we allow these other jurisdictions to be these, like, safe havens for, you know, non-compliant exchanges and non-compliant offerings, our own investors and our own citizens are going to go there and they're going to be, um, you know, damaged. Um, the, this topic is token taxonomy. So based on our experience at CoinList, where we've helped and just spoken with and worked with hundreds of issuers, some of the, um, the way we kind of categorize the types of tokens, we put them into three buckets. And, you know, I'm, I don't think these buckets are the be-all, end-all, but I also think it's important for us to get something practical out of today and really maybe come away with some types and definitions and things that we can use going forward when we think about what a safe harbor might look like or when we think about what the specific criteria might be to actually qualify as a non-security. And so I think it's good also to kind of think about the different types of tokens and that there might not be a one-size-fits-all criteria for each type of token. We may have to, you know, create specific rules or requirements for, you know, depending on the way that token is issued or the purpose of that token. So. At Coinless, we see tokens in three, you know, buckets. The first being that true decentralized token, like with um, Bitcoin and ETH, that actually is, you know, more of a fungible sort of asset that can be used in a commercial sense as consideration for a good or service, uh, something very similar to a currency. Then we see a token that's much more like a good or service, 
um, something that is used to exchange value to receive a service or a good or a right to do something within a network. And then we see a true securities token, which represents some ownership stake or right to an economic gain in some entity or um, you know, company. And that would be something that would always be a security token. And it never, you know, it will always need to be traded on these nationally registered exchanges or ATSs or other things. The other two, not We need so to wrap it up just quickly. Yeah, sorry, Jerry. Um, anyway, I just thought, you know, important to note that those are the kind of buckets we see. And obviously, a one-size-fits-all criteria is not going to work for all of them. Thank you. So I see that um, Congressman Emmer has joined us. Um, so if, I don't want to embarrass him, but if he wants to come up and uh, maybe uh, say a couple words, we'd, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> I'm sorry to make you do it. No, no, it's quite all right. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody being here. My uh, good friend, my colleague, uh, Warren uh, Davidson, who has set up this listening session and uh, represented Bud as well. Uh, I, unfortunately, because of our wonderful schedules around here, I can't, I couldn't be here when it began, and I'm not going to be able to be here when it ends. Uh, this is incredibly uh, important to all of us, uh, where you're coming from, and frankly, your, uh, uh, your uh, description uh, over the last couple of minutes is exactly why it's so important. Uh, Warren has heard me go off on this enough. Uh, we need to know, we need some uh, certainty. Somebody over here was talking about certainty in the marketplace. What is a commodity? What is a currency? What is a security? Who's going to be responsible for the uh, regulation? Whose jurisdiction? Uh, and the people that are in Congress need to get moving on this now. Uh, there's, there's no time for delay. I, the only thing that uh, I'm disappointed in today, but Again, I wasn't able to be here. Uh, otherwise, uh, I probably would have had more discussion with Warren about it. Uh, we have too many members of Congress that don't understand the area that you people are working in. So they seem to run blockchain technology with cryptocurrency, and they're two completely different things. I mean, one's an application, right, uh, that uh, facilitates the other. I, and I, I know when this was originally designed, uh, Representative Davidson was actually going to have a, uh, a certain portion of this discussion about blockchain technology. So hopefully that's where we'll be headed in the very near future. Is talking about that technology and all of its applications, including cryptocurrencies and how they might uh, have that light touch regulation that I think everybody wants to see in the marketplace so that they can continue to grow this thing. And thank you again, Warren, for doing this. Thanks. And I apologize, because I'll probably have to get up now shortly <laughs> and have to leave. We, we, covered the, we covered the challenge of the schedules earlier, but thanks for, thanks for stopping in, Tom. Thank you. Um, so we've got about five more minutes in this uh, session. Um, so I think I see Ms. Bryan in the back. Uh, thank you. My name is Brian. I am at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. and, and I'll echo thanks for, for putting this all together. Uh, and just to, to follow up on, uh, on Ms. Quinn's you know, very thoughtful comments, I mean, one thing that I think Congress should look at when, when we're trying to put things into buckets is you know, what is the purpose of the regulation? If the purpose of the regulation is to protect the consumer, then we need to look at what the bundle of rights and how the issue is being, you know, how the item is being sold to the consumer, because the type of information you need to knowingly purchase a security is different from the type of information you need to purchase something that functions kind of like a commodity, which is different than something you need to purchase a good and service. And there are overlaps among those, but they're not the same. And so we should be thinking about it in that way. And, and, and uh, some, a previous commenter pointed out, and I think this is very true, that I worry sometimes we get too wrapped around the token, you know, the, the fact that there is a token, where that's a means to an end. And the technology may be able to address risks that the current means we use to whatever end uh, generate in a way where maybe we can, you know, modify regulation. But the point is not the token. The point is the underlying transaction that's trying to occur. Thank you. I think we have time for one more. Um, yes, that's all. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Paul Mead. I started a cryptocurrency trading firm in Korea about two years ago. Uh, hello? Hello? Uh, there you go. Okay. Uh, so as I was over there, I was a bit lonely as I don't speak Korean, so I started creating music. Quickly after, I had a couple million streams and I signed to a label. So I was exposed to like issues in the music supply chain. Simultaneously, I was quantitative trading crypto in Korea. So I would look at the products I was trading and see if there's any real users or if it was just speculative investors. And I was kind of frustrated that there wasn't a real platform or like a network behind it of active users for the more like utility focused coins. So over the past like a year and a half, I set out and developed like a functional music streaming platform. And now I'm at the time where I want to go ahead and launch an ICO event. But I'm being told if I want to launch it, I have to hold it as a security, which would limit it to accredited investors. So you see a room like this, probably a majority of accredited investors. People don't want to listen to music from people wearing suits. They want to listen to music from like unaccredited people, individuals that are creating like artistic value. So I don't want to go ahead and launch where if it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, where if I go ahead and launch and it's all accredited investors, I'm going to create a speculative platform. If I want to get real users, get that network effect going, I need to go ahead and be able to sell to unaccredited individuals. So I was meeting with the SEC last Thursday and what I was kind of proposing was basically creating limitations for unaccredited investors to participate in ICO events. So my scenario, let's you to pay $100, $120 a year on Spotify. You would uh, put a limit similar to that for my platform. So now you're kind of removing the economic incentive for speculators, where someone with a, a speculative mindset is going to come to speculate for a potential gain on $100 worth of token. They want to buy 10000 plus. But now you are able to like, get, protect consumers where they'll buy 120 worth, and now it's kind of forcing them in a situation where they'll actually use it on my platform, which is how my company makes revenue. Yeah, thanks Thanks for that. I think you were the first person to touch on uh, directly, you know, the way that you raise the capital and who you can list it with in terms of, you know, over the years, Congress has created securities laws for, you know, Reg A, Reg A+, plus, Reg D, um, Reg CF, and some of you all have, have navigated some of that and, and, and some haven't. The question is, is that framework adequate? Um, and, you know, I'd say if I felt that it was adequate, I wouldn't have hosted the hearing. So the question is, so what should change, and does it all need to change within the SEC? But, you know, I'm glad to hear the, uh, you know, that on the receiving end, there are people that are working with the, the SEC and, uh, and finding good customer service that are helping you try to navigate it. And, and that's as promised from, uh, from Bill Hinman and Director Clayton and a number of others there. So uh, that's, that's good to hear. So that's all the time we have for the first session. I think it's a good place to end it because in the next session on compliance, we'll have an opportunity to talk about accreditation, uh, um, about AMLKYC, and all these questions. So um, with that, let's take a 10-minute break. I think there are refreshments in the back over here, so let's come back around 11.30. Thank you.
Check one, two. Check, check. Testing one, two, three.
We can start grabbing our seats. Let's have a seat. So we can have a seat. We're about to get started. It's already an hour. Okay, <clears throat> so let's get started on uh, the second section, or second session, which is compliance and consumer, consumer protection. And again, this is all very informal, very broad. Um, I'm going to ask a pretty um, just broad question, uh, and I'm actually going to ask um, Josh Stein. And by the way, I know that the uh, sort of taxonomy folks are over there. The future folks are over there. The compliance consumer protections folks, I don't know where they are. So you're all kind of like around here. Um, so please, just don't, don't be shy. Raise your hand. Um, uh, please give priority to folks who know that they're in this session. Um, but if you're not, if you're on the first panel or the third panel, please raise your hand anyway. So I was going to ask, um, start us off by asking Josh Stein, who um, his uh, company focuses on compliance, to maybe kick us off by asking him, what does compliance mean when we don't have clarity about taxonomy. So when we think about taxonomy, or sorry, when we think about compliance, we're thinking about accreditation, we're thinking about disclosures, uh, AML, KYC, we're thinking about um, what kind of exchange um, you can trade on, we're even potentially thinking about money transmission licensing. Um, so broadly, how should we think about compliance? So we'll get Josh maybe to, to start us off, and then we'll please raise your hands and respond to him or say your own piece. Sure. So I'm Joshua Stein. I'm the CEO of Harbor. Harbor was founded to tokenize traditional private securities and provide a compliance solution for issuing them and how they trade. So think sharing a private company, LP interest in a fund, things that everyone acknowledges are securities. 
I think the question Jerry just asked of how do we think about compliance for tokens is a question today of choosing which rules apply, which regulatory regime are you under. And I want to focus my remarks on why the securities laws are a bad one for what most people are talking about. Um, there are, for the securities laws, they broadly regulate three big buckets. The who, what, and where. Who the buyer and seller are, what the trade is, and where it occurs. Who the buyer and seller are are things like KYC ML, things like a credit investor status, all sorts of complex rules that um, affiliates of the issuer and control persons think insider trading restrictions, all sorts of other restrictions apply. Um, it's also who can participate, licensed broker dealers, things of that nature, qualified custodians. So there's a very tight degree and complex degree of regulation about who can be a buyer, who can be a seller, and who can be involved in it. What the trade is is our complex rules around um, minimum, maximum investor numbers, concentration limits. If you think of uh, private real estate investment trust, for example, minimum of 100 shareholders, maximum of 2,000, you have to go public. There are all sorts of complex rules like that. And then finally, there's where the trade can occur. So for securities, it's in a properly licensed ATS, alternative trading system, a properly licensed security exchange. Those rules work fine for securities. And in fact, um, the fact that they are so complex and cumbersome is precisely why I have a company, because we make it easy to comply. But those rules don't work for what we've been talking about here as an industry, which is these utility tokens or protocol tokens. And the reason why is if you think about what they're about, they're about a decentralized or distributed software application, it just doesn't work with rules that are that cumbersome. If every time I want to use a decentralized Microsoft Word or I want to store files, like with Filecoin, imagine if every time you use Dropbox, you had to go contact a broker dealer, go through a KYC process, perhaps be accredited, buy your Dropbox subscription on a licensed exchange, and then go through a whole bunch of reporting requirements. It's just, it just doesn't work. And so um, I'm going to leave it to my colleagues here in the industry to talk about what rules should apply. Um, but the securities laws are a great fit for traditional securities. They're not a good fit for what we're trying to do. Hi. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Vince Molinari. I'm co-founder of Templa Markets, and we are a fintech blockchain holding company. Uh, that focuses on modernization of security law that intersects with the most innovative technologies uh, to create a new market infrastructure for digital assets that are securities. So I, I agree with many, many of Josh's comments. Uh, my comments will focus on the security marketplace. And with that said, I'm a licensed registered person in the securities industry for 30 years and absolutely have huge empathy for the Filecoin team, what Brian over Chia is doing. Uh, I, I will go out there and say those instruments, although issued perhaps as security, we don't see the benefit of what the network effect can be when you force that into a security token structure, the efficiency, the networking effect, et cetera, et cetera. We have some other thoughts on how that might be able to be funded, but for the moment, really what we do, uh, we have a wholly owned subsidiary, which is a, a registered broker deal, an alternative trading system, and a... Um, a, a qualified matching service with the Department of Treasury for trading and limited partnership interest. So I think we've gotten clarity, although um, we've written many comment letters and petitions uh, to the Commission, and they've been very cooperative and engaging, I have to say, on, I'd say, the issuance and the secondary trading of digital assets that are securities. I think what I'd like to bring forward is, is, is the back-end infrastructure, the clearance settlement and depository process. Uh, because as security tokens that are private instruments unregistered, we don't have a mechanism that works there today. So uh, it's great to have Jennifer in front of me from DTCC. When we start to go down the path when uh, the Commission would like to see self-clearing, we get into the quagmire of starting the process of saying, we'd love to have a self-clearing entity. However, there's been eight, um, maybe nine, self-clearing organizations approved in the last five years in the, or in the U.S., all start with receiving a DTCC number. These instruments are not DC, DTCC eligible, so you can't even start that process. So we need a level of innovation and modernization of security law to recognize that these private securities that are now achieving tradability are indeed different. We need mechanisms when we talk about custody. 
How does that work? Are these much more akin to uh, the Investment Advisor Act uh, uh, 2013-04, I believe it is, where you can have certification of these instruments that don't require custody in the traditional sense? And we can go on and on, but Jerry, I won't. So uh, thank you all. Hi, uh, Pat Perducci. I have a background in law and technology. I'm at uh, Consensus now. Um, I, uh, I agree with a lot of what everybody's saying here. I think I just want to emphasize that I think right now one of the, the key aspects actually of consumer protection, um, interestingly enough, is getting the clarity around um, when are these uh, tokens that are designed to be used and consumed, these utility tokens or consumer utility tokens, when are they, you know, securities or when are they something like commodities or these digital consumer goods the way they're intended to be? Um, and, and I think, you know, briefly, the reason why that's the case is, you know, building on what I think Hillary was describing earlier, um, I think the thing that's most, uh, most exciting about this space is this idea that, you know, these business models, these platforms that we have today that are, um, popular based on network effects, you know, Facebook, Uber, the, the fundamental value of these platforms that are derived from the users that are using this technology, um, the value of that activity can actually be captured by the actual users themselves um, instead of being captured by, you know, a company or a platform that is using that activity or using that private data of the users. Um, the users themselves on these token-powered versions of these networks can participate in the value creation on the networks. And I think that's really um, exciting for a lot of reasons. Um, but I think that if, if you have one of these tokens that is designed to be like a consumer utility token to drive one of these decentralized networks, um, if that token ultimately is deemed to be a security because they didn't follow the right procedures or there's confusion or whatever, I mean, that can really fundamentally decimate the network. Um, and then, so you have all these consumers who are buying this because, you know, they wanted to be on this decentralized Uber or they wanted to do file sharing or whatever. Um, the, the ability of them to participate on this network could really be, be decimated. And, and just as a quick example of that, if you have a, for example, decentralized Uber where in order to have, uh, you know, be a driver or a rider, you need to hold this token. If that token is a security, as Josh said, you know, the securities laws aren't designed to uh, apply to assets that are meant to be used or consumed. And so what you're going to end up in that case is in order to participate on this decentralized Uber, you need to log on to a brokerage account or an ATS account, and the only drivers are people who are accredited investors or something like that. And it just fundamentally defeats the purpose of the network and ultimately is fundamentally bad for consumer protection of people who are trying to buy the token to participate in the network. Yep, thanks. I, I think you touched on a couple things there that are interesting. One, New York City already tried tokenizing uh, the access to selling rides in, the, in a certain tight space, uh, and uh, Uber, Uber's uh, a threat to that, so they're, they're, they're working through it. But um, I, I had a really interesting conversation uh, with an event that uh, Congressman Emmer hosted, and we were talking about this event and the idea for creating some sort of certainty in the market to get this uh, ICO market to really flourish. And uh, one of the guys suggested that it's even more basic than that. Uh, it's your data. You have to get to the point that uh, the people that have profited heavily right now uh, off of commoditizing data that we've largely all given to them free. Uh, you could, you could monetize this, all right? So the number of things that this could go to covers everything uh, from intellectual property to goods to services, and uh, their application is essentially creating a digital identity for people that, that don't have banks uh, in Africa uh, that are really trying to have a way out of poverty. So this could be in a way, way more democratic than the, the, only the special people, which is my view of the accredited investor uh, kind of range. Only the special people can invest in this. Uh, or frankly, by definition, only the people that have already made a lot of money can have access to make money off of this idea. Um, and so I think that uh, we do have a chance to, to do that with a, with a token, regardless of how it's structured. And the question is, can we do that in a way that, that meets the needs that are, that are out there in the market to protect against fraud and everything else? But, uh, but thanks for framing that. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, Mark Murphy from Digital Currency Group. Uh, we're one of the oldest and largest investment companies in the space. Um, we've invested in a number of the companies here today, Coinbase, Blockchain, Protocol Labs, and, and several others. Um, we've been focused today mostly on the policy considerations, which is obviously of paramount importance here. Uh, but Congressman, you just touched on an important point um, that is really more of a political argument. Um, there are companies in this space and narratives that will resonate across the political spectrum. We invest in companies all over the world that are tackling a lot of different challenges, whether it's democratizing financial services, improving health care, uh, working with law enforcement to help them identify bad actors. There are narratives that will resonate with all members of Congress. And as we move forward with any legislative uh, solutions that, uh, that Congress is considering, um, I hope uh, members of Congress do consider that this should be a bipartisan effort. There are early libertarian roots that everybody understands in this space, but as I said, there are narratives that will uh, resonate across the country that do affect all Americans and, frankly, people around the world. And as we think about uh, the last hundred years of American dominance as a technology center, the having light touch regulations and legislation to ensure that we continue to maintain that leadership position for the next hundred years is going to be really important, and it's going to uh, require members from across the, the, the political spectrum. Thanks. My name is Kieran Raj. I'm a chief strategy officer of Bittrex, which is one of the largest U.S.-based cryptocurrency trading platforms. Uh, we offer you know, purchase and sale for our users of Bitcoin, Ether, and a number of other different uh, tokens. Um, well, I have a business hat on at Bittrex, I want to a moment put on my old national security hat. So before I joined Bittrex, I was the Deputy General Counsel at the Department of Homeland Security, and I also worked for the Deputy Attorney General at the Department of Justice, focused on national security and cybersecurity issues. And one of the really important points I think sometimes gets lost in this discussion is U.S.-based compliance, especially for, you know, your customer rules, anti-money laundering rules are really, really strong and very important in the global environment. And so a company like ours, which has to register as a money services business under FinCEN, has these obligations. And what that means is we're able to help uh, both law enforcement and our national security professionals if bad actors are using uh, cryptocurrency and they can trade it, trace it back to our trading platform or other U.S.-based trading platforms. They can come in with legal process and we can actually give them a name associated with a particular address, whereas, as many of you know, most blockchains are pseudo-anonymous. So if you only have an address and don't have a name, it's not as helpful. But in the United States, uh, we, can give, we can give a name. But what's unfortunately happening, and there's folks touched on it last panel, is there's a lot of things that are moving overseas. So there's an economic argument why we don't want that, but there's also a national security argument, because when I was at the Department of Justice, if we had to go get legal process from somebody overseas, good luck, right? It's an MLAT process. It could take six months to a year and a half, which is no good for investigations like terrorist financing and others, which sometimes needs much faster turnaround time. And so I think it's something that uh, is a very important piece that shouldn't get lost in the focus on the economics, but there's, there's really a national security piece, both for tracing bad actors, but also we're seeing a lot of countries trying to stand up a separate financial system for the United States. We saw Venezuela with the petrodollar, Russia's talked about it, and people who are trying to get around U.S. sanctions, right? That's been a huge tool for us uh, from a national security perspective. So, you know, when we talk about the regulatory clarity in the United States, it's not just for the economic piece, which is obviously important, but it's so that we continue to be leaders in this space and don't cede ground to others internationally. Thank you very much, Congressman. I'm going to touch on a few things that, that you said and Pat and, and Mark. Um, I'm Ryan Selkis. I'm the founder and CEO of Masari. We're a blockchain data company that's promoting transparency and building a disclosures database for crypto projects, which you could think of almost like an Edgar for this industry. The question, of course, becomes how do you build Edgar without a regulatory mandate? And for a globally traded asset class, that doesn't fit into a nice, neat little bucket. And we tend to take a little bit more of a pragmatic approach and think about the spirit of existing securities law and consumer protection law. Uh, when we think about what could go into this data library, at least early on, 
because quite frankly, and with all due respect, I think most of us in the, this room are terrified of running a process of defining what an S1 would look like when there are this many different opinions in the same room. Um, that can start very simply, right? It can be who is affiliated with the project, how are tokens being distributed, and ultimately, who's making money, when and how, and at whose expense. And I think if we look at the root cause and, and some of the root issues with respect to fraud, with respect to consumer protections, the most striking issue right now comes down to the fact that these assets are not being used for their intended design, at least today, and that's fine, right? It's still a very speculative market. It's driven by investors versus users. That will change, but in the interim, as we consider how to actually best protect consumers, investors, the retail public, I think we have to start a little bit more basic and ask simpler questions, particularly of the projects themselves, and then the choke points and liquidity providers in the system that are actually in a position to drive some of these dis disclosures going forward without running a large-scale process and defining what a 26-section document l would look like, which might not necessarily be a good fit for this asset class. Hello. Hi, I'm Lily Tesler. I'm a partner at Sidley Austin and head up the fintech blockchain practice out of our New York office. I've been working in this blockchain space for several years now, really working with companies trying to navigate all of the regulatory issues surrounding various blockchain token offerings, as well as some of the secondary trading issues, regulatory concerns that stem from that. And there's been a lot of discussion here regarding compliance with the securities laws surrounding the initial fundraising or issuance of the tokens, which there's a clearly defined regulation there, although there are certain areas that require some clarification. But another area that stems from the taxonomy discussion earlier is what happens with compliance when those tokens, once it's clearly defined, that are not securities, are implemented in the various emerging company practices. So there will come a time when we'll get some type of clarity and hopefully sooner rather than later on what is fully functional and what is fully decentralized. And when that comes, a lot of these emerging companies developing blockchain will be developing it in different industries. And it's important to remember in compliance and consumer protection that as companies are developing in industries such as healthcare, insurance, media entertainment, transportation, each of those industries have their own set of regulations and have their own compliance requirements. And each of those companies will need to comply with those. And the tokens that are on those blockchains will need to be consistent with each of those compliance regimes and can't lose sight, sight of focus on the securities laws here, where then there are a lot of other regulations that apply to these companies as they're trying to implement and develop uh, across multiple industries. My name is Will Munsell. I work uh, in legal and strategy at Sweetbridge. We are a global uh, alliance of projects um, trying to provide economic tools. Uh, for individuals and companies to do things like asset-backed lending and loyalty and rewards programs. I want to thank the congressman uh, for the invite. Uh, thank especially the staff for putting this, uh, this event together. Uh, that's where often a lot of the work does fall. Um, just wanted to make a couple of quick points. As, as a company that's looking at this space, trying to figure out how to be innovative uh, in the United States, um, We've talked a lot about problem number one, which is the distribution problem. The goal is uh, getting useful tokens into the hands of customers. That's step one. We've talked a lot about that, and there have been some, I think, really uh, intelligent contributions. Um, what we would say on that is we think Congress does need to act. Um, the SEC has provided some good, uh, some good starting points for discussion, but two weeks ago they, they, they did walk back and, and at least – let us know that that's not necessarily binding. Uh, and as, as we know, that the director's, uh, Director Hinman's speech is not necessarily binding um, on the agency. So we know that. The second problem is the licensed uses problem. Uh, I think uh, Lilia just touched on that. And I, that's, that's an important thing as we have this discussion as well. Um, just a couple of principles on that front. Uh, we think that in many ways, competition between projects and between uh, innovative projects and the legacy financial uh, services industry, that's actually something that can be good for consumer protection. Uh, if, if we think that having all the licenses has been 
necessarily uh, a way to, to protect consumers. Uh, we can look at what's happened with, with Wells Fargo and many other uh, big financial institutions. It, a compliance budget and full licensing doesn't always protect consumers. We think competition can help do that. We also think that regulatory barriers to entry also uh, often can't justify themselves in terms of harms avoided. So we should be thinking about ways uh, to actually create a, a, a system where more people can experiment um, in this space. So those are a couple of the principles that, that we think are important uh, in this discussion. Well, thank you. Uh, Paul Atkins, I'm CEO of Potomac Global Partners, uh, co-chairman of uh, the Token Alliance of the Chamber of Digital Commerce, and I was a SEC commissioner a decade ago for about six years. Um, I wanted to, as far as consumer protection goes, I mean, it's uh, a big topic, but I think it's being put uh, pretty well by a former counsel of mine who's now a commissioner in her, her own right, Hester Purse, who uh, I guess is being dubbed the crypto mom. But uh, she um, she's raised in a speech and, you know, kind of laid down the gauntlet for her fellow commissioners the tension that's inherent uh, in the securities laws, the federal securities laws, between uh, – uh, disclosure regime, which is basically what most of the federal securities laws are about, versus merit regulation, which was is the mantra of many state laws, and also has infused some of the federal laws as well. And so these laws, all of which uh, you know came about back in the 30s in a paper-based environment, of course have been informed by court cases, by market practice, uh, and then of course by the SEC rules uh, built on all of that. So because of this tension, um, and with the uh, Token Alliance, we, we came out with a, with a white paper uh, that uh, you know, talks about the utility of utility tokens and that they uh, you know, not only, I think, are uh, you know, adequate and, and uh, you know, defensible in principle, but actually necessary for the formation of this market like, uh, like you've heard this morning. But we have to remember that it's not just the federal government that is involved in this. There are lots of other jurisdictions. Uh, with the Token Alliance, we have uh, uh, discussions of other jurisdictions, foreign ones, UK, Canada, Australia, Gibraltar, and whatnot, and more to come. But we have to remember that we have 50 states here, and uh, those states have many different uh, people who have uh, interest in the securities markets, uh, and they are tend to, they're either attorneys general, they're uh, you know parts of other uh, agencies within those state governments. But each one has its own power, and some are more powerful than others. For example, uh, New York with the Martin Act, uh, uh, the AG up there wields a pretty heavy club, and so we have to keep that in mind. And so as you all approach you know, developing a safe harbor, we can talk more about that in the next uh, panel about uh, ICOs and whatnot. I think it's really important uh, to remember that you're not just doing this in the background. You need to give the SEC tools um, uh, with respect to how they can uh, be the preeminent uh, regulator in this. I'm not trying to raise the P word or anything like that for preemption, but uh, you, know, you have to come uh, informed uh, you know, with that, respectfully speaking. Thanks. Thank you. So I work extensively with early stage tech and early stage development companies. Uh, one of my side jobs is I'm managing director of a uh, startup accelerator in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, we're the local chapter of Founder Institute, which is the uh, world's largest idea stage accelerator program. So uh, we work all over the world really with uh, early stage tech. And I think really what's at issue is more from a compliance standpoint for the United States around early stage capital formation. Uh, how, how you raise the money, whether it's token sales, um, you know, how we comply with these things. I can tell you it, it costs a lot of money just to file a Reg CF. And you're talking ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 if you're dealing with competent counsel from a security standpoint. And there's a gap and there's a delta between what is required from a regulatory compliance standpoint to just put basic, very simple capital into place to prove an idea. And I, I think that that's why there's a lot of flight offshore from a capital standpoint. Uh, innovators are seeing the opportunity, hey, I can go to Dubai and run a token sale 
and I can raise money and I can fund my project. And this is counter to even American innovation and security when I look down the road and say five, eight, ten years, where are we going to be at when we deny American investors the capital appreciation opportunity here in the United States? Certainly we can contract back onshore with services development groups, but you're really talking about the growth of the capital from an investor standpoint down the road, and I think that this is going to hurt our position into the future. And the dichotomy exists that I or anyone, even as an unaccredited investor, can take $10,000 cash into the local Speedway gas station and buy scratch-off tickets without even providing an ID with cash. Why can't I put money into American innovation and make investments as an unaccredited investor? It doesn't make sense. Thank you. So I just yeah, it's an ongoing separate debate on accredited investors, but but yeah, so um, I, I wouldn't be the best person to answer that, answer that. But I think it's more a rhetorical question. But. So I just realized that with these lights, I've not been seeing the folks right in front of me who have questions. So. Why don't we go here first and we'll go to Jesse. Can you bring the mic over here, please? Hi. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> I'm Carla from Circle. Um, we run a crypto exchange and we're, you know, a crypto company. They hired me from the SEC. I was at the SEC for 13 years to try to kind of figure out this black box of regulation, right? So you can tell how important it is to to find a way to move forward in this. And I think the biggest issue is going to be taxonomy. And I agree with Georgia that if it is a security more like the, the EU framework where it looks like a share, it looks like a bond, it absolutely should be regulated by the SEC. Otherwise, it shouldn't because it doesn't fall into the way that this works doesn't lend itself to securities regulation. I think the gentleman from Harbor said that and the gentleman over here. Like we as an exchange, if we are going to transact in securities, the blockchain technology doesn't fit, right? There is no intermediary. There is no DTCC. It's all us. So I think Congress has to act because the SEC, and I worked there a long time with some really great people, but they kind of said what they thought was right, right? And they've done what they think they're going to do. And in a lot of ways, it was really fantastic that they came out and did that. But I think that's it. So we need a taxonomy that makes sense. And then we need some exemptions from the, you know, the secondary trading piece to make sure that our markets remain liquid. Does someone else want to speak to this? Thanks. Um, just to, to piggyback on, on um, beating the exemption drum, I think that um, we're seeing um, a lot of opportunity overseas where projects are, are excluding the United States from, from their capital raises um, and, and doing offerings to the entire rest of the world. Um, this gives them a wide investor base. Often foreign companies are, are now able to to outraise their domestic U.S. competitors um, because they have the, the whole world um, who will invest with them. Uh, and, and often, um, who raises the most money is, is who wins. And so not only are um, U.S. companies not able to raise enough to be competitive globally, uh, U.S. investors are not able to invest in those global winners. So um, I think that we need some sort of um, an exemption, and, and it can't be you've got to be a millionaire to invest um, in startups. I mean, one of the great things about blockchain is that it, it can remove the middleman. You, you have stocks, um, explicit tokenized securities that, that effectively are, are bearer bonds, and um, by removing the middleman and having blockchain technology track the ownership, um, the cost is very low. And so it, you can have a portfolio of, of 10 assets for $10, and the risk is extremely low. And as the gentleman mentioned here, you can walk into a 7-Eleven and buy lottery tickets. Why can't I buy $10 worth of stock in 10 different companies? And you know, as, as a, a consumer, the risk is very low. Even if they're all scams, so what? You know, I probably have better odds in the lottery. 
Terrific. Um, first, thanks for, for having us all in here. Again, it's important and we appreciate your, your attention to this matter. Um, so I'm, I'm Mike Lampress. I'm with Coinbase, which is uh, one of the world's largest uh, exchanges and, and custodians of, of different currencies. Uh, very quickly on the issue of compliance and consumer protection, I just want to say, uh, for the position of an exchange, we are dealing with a number of different regulators, and Paul Atkins mentioned this, but the SEC looks at this and says, says it may be a security, the CFTC says it may be a commodity, IRS says it's property, FinCEN says it's money. We've got 42 licenses in 40 states. Um, we operate in 34 countries. Okay, so the, the regulatory overhang is large. Uh, but I think the actual, the, the biggest chilling effect to doing, regulatory chilling effect doing business in the U.S. is this, this lack of certainty. Um, it is not possible for us to look at an asset and determine whether it is a security or not prospectively. Very, I shouldn't say it's not possible. It's very, very difficult to do that. Um, and, and as a result, um, the, the chilling effect is enormous because the penalties to getting that wrong are huge. And what that means is if there's 2,500 tokens out there, we at Coinbase are only able to support today five of those tokens. Okay, there are far more than five of them that are very good, solid tokens that represent value that consumers want, that investors want, and, and there's a cost to us not being able to provide them. I'd also uh, mention that there's a law of unintended consequences that's pretty enormous, and, and that is that to the extent that there's a chilling effect in the U.S., Consumers are still accessing these tokens. They're getting them, and they're getting them from, from unregulated, primarily overseas exchanges. And there is no consumer protection that attaches to those. And that's a, that's a major issue. Uh, two other quick points on, on um, compliance. One is that I think we all want consumers to have confidence in this space. We all, we all want a fair and orderly market. We all want you know, to combat money laundering. We want all the same things that the traditional regulators do. It doesn't have to be done in the same way it was done in the past, and I think we, we need to be open to that. Um, and I finally would, would mention some, one of those is just the hyperspeed of change in this industry. It's incredible. Um, and it's hard to sit here today and predict what the world's going to look like in six months or a year. It, just, it makes it tough to regulate. Um, and that's a challenge I think we recognize that, that exists for the regulators. We're sympathetic, but it, it's, a, it's a reality. Before handing off, one point that has not been raised yet is the IRS. Uh, tax treatment to this is substantial. Uh, and that's, that's at a lot of levels, which approaches not just a, a policy issue about what these are, but also a compliance issue about how, how gains and losses are, are tracked and calculated and how that can work it with, a, with currency, with tokens that are supposed to be a currency, how that can possibly work without some kind of exemption for, uh, from the IRS on this. Thank Thanks. Mike, before you yeah. give up the microphone, what, what is the constraint that keeps you from supporting more than five being the custodian for them? The, the primary constraint is that we cannot say with the uh, prospect of no comes with an asset, yes, that is not, we're, we're not currently uh, authorized to trade securities. We're moving down that path. We've acquired an ATS. We're moving, you know, many of, many other companies are moving down that path as well. But until we're, we're formally regulated and able to trade those securities, we can't. So when we, when we apply the factors of the Howey test, it's unclear often whether something's security or not and when it would transfer from being a security to, to not being a security and how to handle that. So that it's, it's regulatory certainty. I'll tell you, it, it is not technological, just to be clear. The technology, we could easily add these assets. Let me, let me turn to my colleague from Circle. <laughs> I just want to add a little bit. I think it becomes an exercise in risk tolerance, right? And so that's where you kind of see the lines, the different lines. So you may see more assets on Poloniex, which is a circle, because, you know, we've looked at it and, you know, we've made a determination that we don't think it looks like a security, but we don't know, and that's the problem. And we have no idea if the SEC is going to come after us tomorrow. Part of the problem as well is that uh, what is and isn't a security could change day to day. Uh, the SEC often looks at, at things like how is the asset marketed, which could change tomorrow. You could, you could do your, your test today and determine that it's not a security, and, and it could completely change the protocol, that change the way that they're advertising it, and tomorrow it could be a security. And so it's extremely hard to try to keep up with what's happening in the space with all these assets, especially you know, if you get to 2,500. Okay, let's go to Kate over here, and then we'll go to David. 
Great. Thank you so much, Kate Prohaska from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We've been setting up um, a pretty robust work stream on this over the past year. I first want to, again, echo the thanks to Congressman Budd and Congressman Davidson and Congressman Emmer, who's left. Um, my only wish is that we'd have about 400 other congressmen here um, and women to hear this conversation. I mean, what, what keeps coming up in my mind is this isn't the Wild West. This is a lot of people trying to figure out how to comply. And um, I think that is the challenge, you know, what, that we don't hear in the media. You know, you, you always hear the worst things and you aren't hearing, um, you know, the, the people who are really trying to make this happen, you know, whether it's hiring lawyers and whatnot. Um, so we released a series of principles in July. We're going to be um, having Congressman um, uh, Purse come and speak in November. Obviously, the new crypto mom uh, is a champion for all of us. We don't want this to go abroad as well. Um, but I think there's there's pretty much three things that we need to do. One, uh, regulatory coordination. I don't know if we've talked about that too much. We've talked about certainty, but we really need the regulators to coordinate as well. The fact that we have the CFTC, the BCFP or CFPB or whatever we're calling it these days, um, the SEC, you know, whether that's through FSOC possibly, through their coordinating body, um, whether it is a presidential commission, you know, similar to um, how the internet discussion was waged, um, we need to have something like that just to, to make sure that they're all discussing in a formal manner and not just kind of on a one-off basis. Um, in the interim, I think that we also need to really hammer out definitions um, because we all say, you know, let's um, have Congress act and, and different things like that. But I think that as an industry, it is changing so frequently. And so trying to get our head around some kind of flexible, light touch definitions, and that's what we've been trying to do at the chamber. Um, and then also engaging with the regulators. I know many of you, if not all of you are, um, and looking for no action letters. So uh, whether it is at the SEC or I've been working with Paul Watkins, who's now at the BCFP, um, excited to have him over there to see if they could do it from a consumer protection standpoint. So it seems like those are kind of the, the near term and long term issues that we need to be thinking about and just very thankful for these forums. Uh, I'm David Foreman. I'm the general counsel for Fidelity Investments Retail Broker Dealer and in my second more fun job uh, I'm also the lead lawyer for our crypto and blockchain efforts. Uh, I, I've heard a lot of really good points here. I agree with many of them and, and uh, disagree with some. Uh, rather than speak to the merits of any particular position, I think that there's one universal truism here in terms of regulation and compliance, which is that regulation uh, should not be done by enforcement, that it's simply unfair to punish people acting in good faith, which all of us are here today because we are hungry for some kind of regulatory guidance about the right way to do this. Uh, in, in that space, if the rules are unclear, unwritten, or unknown, uh, it's not, it really isn't uh, appropriate to punish people retrospectively for making a wrong guess when they were trying to do it the right way. And I think that's whatever your position on what the regulation ought to be or the taxonomy issues or which regulator it ought to be, uh, I think that is a critical component that we just have to pretty much all agree on. Great. We've got about five minutes left in this session. Um, I see let's go somebody who has not yet talked in the back over there. And we'll go to Kyle over here. Hi, I'm Manny Alejandro. I'm an attorney uh, in New York. I have my own law practice. Again, I want to echo the sentiments and thank uh, everyone for participating and, and thanks for putting this together. I guess my concern is, you know, in hearing all the comments, which I generally agree with, you know, we're kind of all over the place. So I think what we need to really do is create a, a prioritization in terms of coming up with, you know, what do we need to do first, right? Which clearly is probably definitions. But I think, you know, without coming up with, with a structure, um, we're really not going to get anywhere in terms of, you know, next steps and forward progress. What I'm talking about essentially is that, you know, we have a foundation. So when you look at the jurisdictions that um, we were talking about earlier that these projects are moving to, they don't have the complex hierarchy of state government, multiple federal regulators, and so on and so forth. So it's easy for them to put in place some type of rulemaking regime schema that's relatively straightforward. We have to realize that. With that being said, we have to realize, you know, time is of the essence and we don't want to keep losing things, uh, losing projects to uh, foreign jurisdictions where we lose jurisdiction over these projects in terms of protecting U.S. investors. So I think it's important for us to kind of focus, you know, what do we want to 
bite off first? You know, what is the prioritization of our efforts and what would we be most effective at in doing? Let's go to Kyle right here. Hello, uh, my name is Kyle Burgess. I'm with Consumers Research. Thank you so much for hosting us today. Um, I, I'm going to just talk strictly about consumer education for a moment. Um, one of the questions announced in advance was about how can we best protect consumers. Um, and uh, some of the federal agencies have put out guidance um, on cryptocurrencies and initial coin offerings, but a lot of the guidance is more cautionary, beware, don't use this. But as, as many of the speakers have said, consumers are going to invest in these currencies whether, whether they should or should not. Um, so the kinds of education that we have out there now are cautionary, but they need to be more educational in a, if you're going to do this, these are the things that you should know. The FTC has some good, good guidance, but the um, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is, is only cautionary. Um, as Kate mentioned, um, they have someone new heading up innovation over there, and I think that that will change in the near future. But we really need to focus on education that is going to help people make smart choices because they're going to make these choices in any case. Um, just some notes on clarity. Uh, the clarity that affects the industry also affects consumers. Uh, increased compliance costs get passed on to consumers, and so they're paying more for, for these innovative products and services. Uh, they also lack clarity um, in tax filings for themselves. Um, as someone mentioned, the IRS originally called it property, then I think it was commodity, and now it's a capital asset. And uh, as filing my own taxes is challenging. I asked for an extension this year because I own cryptocurrency, and I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, and then finally, um, to echo, actually Kate took the words right out of my mouth, which is um, next steps. Um, she mentioned a presidential commission. There could also be a congressional commission. Um, I, at our organization, we're thinking about a working group. Um, we've convened a few summits uh, in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire on this topic. Actually, Ron Hammond from your office uh, participated in one of our summits this summer. Um, but to get these definitions on paper, we're not going to be able to do that with a room this size. We need, you know, 20 people in a room who know a lot about this, like, tackling this issue and really figuring out what to call these things. Um, obviously, getting public feedback on that, but without actually getting um, public-private partnerships from the diff like coordinating different regulatory bodies, as well as the people like the people in this room, we're not going to get that clarity that we need. Um, finally, we submitted papers to you, and I'm really grateful for the call for papers, and we'll continue to submit more. We have time for one more question, so let's go to Yolanda right here. Thank you. Is this on? Um, I'm Yolanda Getch I'm from NASDAQ. I'm Deputy General Counsel. Um, you know, NASDAQ is a global fintech company, and so we come, um, we look at these issues from the perspective of, you know, being a technology provider to uh, exchanges, broker dealers, other uh, regulated entities uh, around the world. And also, you know, we are a regulator and we operate in very heavily regulated. Um, uh, jurisdictions and, and industries. Um, you know, and I think, you know, one of our core missions really is to promote transparency and accountability and to operate fair and orderly markets. So I do think that, you know, the experience of us more established exchanges is sort of instructive, you know, as we're sort of establishing uh, new markets for, for new asset classes. And what we have found is that, um, you know, when there is regula regulatory clarity in, you know, with respect to any asset classes, any asset class, it really does uh, uh, promote um, trading and, and increase li liquidity and bring in more market participants. So I do think we, we, we should keep that in mind and, and not forget, you know, as we get to the te technical aspect of whether something's a security or a token or anything um, else, that, you know, we do focus on, uh, you know, uh, investor protection a a as a core uh, tenant. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, what we're talking about today, you know, other folks have mentioned the, the issues when, you know, we talked a lot about the attributes of the token. Is it a security? Is it a commodity? Is it something else? And then what happens when, when you know, there's secondary trading? And I think we do need clarity on both um, you know, a token that is a security in different aspects of, of, of trading I had been mentioned before, the clearing uh, features, uh, you know, the regulatory scheme for clearing and settlement doesn't really, you know, apply or, or work very well in, in the token environment. 
and also custody issues, which were already mentioned as, as well. Um, and, uh, you know, because of this lack of uh, clarity, uh, regulatory clarity, I think, you know, we have seen some movement towards self-regulation uh, among these uh, crypto markets. And, you know, that's a core tenant for the securities exchanges, obviously, and that's a core tenant of the of Section 6 of the Exchange Act. Um, but, uh, you know, self-regulation without at least having a general regulatory framework to work with or to even understanding of, you know, which regulator um, will, um, you know, be the primary regulator of these tokens it, it is, is, you know, a half measure. So that's all the time we have for the second panel. Uh, if I didn't get a chance to call on you, um, don't worry. Third panel's coming up, and um, we're going to be able to continue talking about all these questions. Um, we've got lunch uh, in the back. Uh, please feel free to go up and grab some lunch, bring it back to your place, um, and we'll get started again um, at uh, 1 p.m. sharp. Thank you.